Jesus Christ, his life, his ministry, his death, and his resurrection. I thank God for your coming. I want us to begin today in a special way by asking Elder to come and pray for us. So Elder, kindly come and offer pray for us. We are praying. Our Heavenly Father, Lord who stays in heaven, we want to thank you so much for giving us this chance to come unto your feet so that you can teach us all that you want us to know at this particular moment. Thank you because you are our, our God, horns of salvation. Father, may we be under your feet as we listen. Give us power so that we can hear what you are teaching us. Thank you because this is the message that will save us at this particular end time. Open our ears so that we can hear it and understand. We want to put our speaker into your hand as he's going to talk to us, Lord. Use him as your face so that the message can reach unto us as you needed. For this is our humble prayer. We want to believe and trust that you will answer us in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Elder, for connecting us to heaven through prayer. How many were here yesterday? We learned something very important about uh, about Sorry. We learned something very important about this particular piece of furniture. And we saw yesterday that this piece of furniture in itself is a shadow of Jesus Christ. Okay? Before we go to the lamp that was put to burn in this altar, the altar itself is a shadow of Christ. And, and we realized, and by the way, we have very limited time. And we may not go into all the specific details about the altar. But I chose specifically to talk about the horns of the altar. And we saw yesterday that the horns are a shadow of Jesus Christ. We read that from the Bible. And we also saw that by sprinkling blood at the horns of the altar, it symbolized the transfer of the sin from a sinner to the real horn of our salvation. Who is who? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. So when the priest sprinkled the blood here, it symbolized transfer of our sins to Christ. And we saw that one of the greatest significances of this altar is that it symbolizes reconciliation. Because God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And because of the gift of reconciliation that he wrote in Christ, he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. And I remember we challenged ourselves, for those who are here, that for your spiritual experience to advance, something must happen. There has to be reconciliation one to another. And we challenged ourselves. How many tried? We challenged ourselves to go back and make a decision to reconcile one to another. How many tried? It is the hardest thing to do. I understand. But you see how hard it is. Minus it, we want to grow to the next experience. Tomorrow we are going to talk about this particular piece of furniture. That is called the lever. 
the way you find it difficult to reconcile to another. is much more less than the way Christ found it difficult to go to the cross. Are we together? Because this altar stands for the cross of Jesus Christ. And some people take excuse and say, well, I, was not, I did not offend him or her. He is the one who offended me or she is the one who offended me. And therefore, he is the one to do what? To look for me that we may. Let me ask you. Between the fallen human race and Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who offended the other? Who offended the other? And so Christ waited in heaven and went to him. Is that what the Bible teaches? Is that what the Bible teaches? That Christ, who is our example, you see this? book of uh, Peter, that Christ who is our example. If Christ is really our example, then who should really seek for the other? <laughs> so if you have been waiting for somebody who offended you to come and seek reconciliation, then it's the other way around. You who have been offended seek reconciliation. Are you together, my dear friend? Is it hard? It sometimes is hard. It is really hard. It is not an easy thing. Number one, because it battles self. Are we together? Ellen White says, the greatest battle that was ever fought is the battle against self. Are we together? So your real enemy is you not know that other person, is not politicians, is not terrorists, is not environment. The greatest battle that was ever fought is the battle against self. We have flipped the coin and get another meaning of that, that, that statement is that if the greatest battle that was ever fought against self, then what is the greatest victory that was ever won? The greatest victory that one can ever win. Is the victory against? So who should we fight with? <laughs> where should our focus of the where is our fiercest battle? Now I want to I want to show you something. Anyway, this is just an additional information to what we are doing. We saw here on the first day that. At the beginning of your spiritual walk, you must make a decision to do what? To obey the Ten Commandments of God and to believe in the blood of Christ and to make Christ an absolute ruler of your what? Of your life. You see, whatever God asks of us, anything that is of godly origin, I told you before, God requires from us. He knows that that is not of human origin. It cannot come from yourself. So God takes an initiative and works this one out in Christ and then he lifts it up from Christ and gives it to you as a gift that you may have the experience. Mm. 
Now, for instance, did Christ obey the law of God? Did he obey? He says, everything that he did. You believe me? Believe in the works that I do. Because every word I say is from my Father. Christ says that over and over. That everything he did was from the instruction of the who? Of the Father. Now I want to show you something from the Bible. Who is Christ? Who is Christ? What did we see the Bible say? Who is Christ? Christ is God. A hundred percent God. Are we together? Who created? Jesus Christ. Who made you? Christ. So Christ is as much God as God the Father is. Are we together on that point? Now I want to show you something. When he comes and takes upon himself humanity, did he cease to become God? Did he stop God to be God? No. no. Because Paul says, referring to the person, the man Jesus Christ, he says, in him dwelleth all the fullness of Godhead bodily. And you see, this is, this is, this is also shown to us. When they take him to the sanctuary to be dedicated, who was the high priest? Who was the high priest? Zechariah? Who was the high priest? He pleaded with, the God, with God that he may not see death until what happens? Until he sees the Redeemer of the world. And God saw life without seeing death, even though his time to die was past. And so when Christ is brought before him, the high priest, so many people are around. They see the child of man. And nobody knows who really he is. But this old man, when he carries Christ upon the palms of his hands, his spiritual eyesight is opened. And he beholds the Son of God, who is God, in his hands. And when he realized that he is carrying God in his hands, he said, Now, my Lord, I can do what? I can rest, because I have seen my Redeemer. Because in Christ, there is the fullness of Godhead bullied. Even though he walked as a man, although he was really a man, in him was the fullness of Godhead bodily. Now him who is one with the Father has chosen to take upon himself the nature of man, the nature that is subject to death as we had seen. When he comes, he chooses to suppress himself so much that when he does anything, Although he is God, he chooses to take instructions from the, uh, from the Holy Spirit of God. Although he and the Father are one. He suppresses himself. Now let me tell you this, that, that might shock you. Apart from the temptations that he had at the hill, when the devil take, took him to the uh, highest after 40 days of fasting, the greatest temptation that Christ ever experienced is to manifest himself as a God. Are we together? is to manifest himself as when they went to arrest him what did he say when they went to arrest him he said did you know 
I can command. How many legends? How many legends? Did you know he can command the legions to come because where did he get authority to command the legions? What are the legions? These are, are, are structures of angels in heaven. Do you know the angels are organized in a military fashion? If we have time, we are going to talk about angels. I'm not sure if we really have time to talk about this. The angels in heaven. Although he is here as a human being, he still had the authority to command the angels to come from heaven and rescue him from death. But what did he do? He chose to suppress himself so that his real self does not manifest himself. Are we together, my dear friends? And on the basis of what he he has opened the way for victory over self. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. You can overcome self because Christ fought against self and he overcame. On the other hand, when he was approaching the Gethsemane, he pleaded with the Father, let this cup be Let this cup pass. His humanity was so scared. The man Jesus Christ was so scared of death that his will as a man in him for us and to us a child is born and unto us a son is given. The child of Mary was scared of death until he was really afraid of death and he asked God I have a will I have a self I have a desire my desire is to escape from this but your will be done in other words Christ surrendered his will absolutely control Holy Spirit until the Holy Spirit guided every step of his life. That is so significant for us to know. He did that not for himself. He was not saving himself. He did that so that we might be saved. But how are we saved? When we receive the gift of obedience that he exercised while he lived on earth. That is very significant, we need to know as a people. Now let me show you part two of uh, reconciliation that is in this altar. And I want us to read from the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 16, <coughs> 46 to 48. If you have time, read the whole of that chapter yourself. Numbers chapter 16, 46 to 48. The background of this story is that they had rebelled against Moses. 16 from verse 46. Well, if you have time, read the whole of that chapter. You'll get rich information that because of time, I cannot get into the details of this particular verse. It says, <coughs> Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of the congregation. What is the tabernacle of the congregation? This is the outer, this is the outer court. So Moses and Aaron went to the outer court. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Get you up from among this congregation. In other words, separate yourself from these people. Because I want to do something. I want to wipe out the entire generation. Because they have rebelled against me. So God is telling Moses, Separate yourself from these people because I want to discipline them. I want to wipe them out. So he says, Get you up. 
up from among this congregation that I may consume them as, as in a moment. And they fell upon their faces. I love Moses. Because remember, these people had rebelled against him. And now God wants to f wipe them out in a moment. What is Moses doing? He's rushing into the, uh, 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 into the courtyard and falling by his face on the ground to God. And what did God say to God? And Moses said unto Aaron, Sir, and put fire thereon from off the altar, and put on incense, and go quickly unto the congregation, and make an atonement for them. For there is wrath gone out from the Lord. The plague has begun. They are dying. Moses, who has the Spirit of God in himself, the Spirit of God is, God is not slack concerning his, promise. his promises. As people consider slackness. In other words, God is not slow concerning the fulfillment of his promises. As people consider speed. So he tells Moses, Moses has the Spirit of God. What does Moses do? He says, continue saying, and Aaron took, as Moses commanded, and ran into the midst of the congregation. And behold, the plague was begun among the people. And he put on incense and made an atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living, and the plague was stayed. Now... They that died in the plague were 14,700. Besides them that died about the matter of Korah. And Aaron returned unto Moses, unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and the plague was stayed. We are talking about the altar of burnt offering as a means of reconciliation. Here is a people that have rebelled against God. Instead of God staying, number one, we see the, the, the character of God displayed in Moses himself. By the way, I tend to think that God wanted to teach Moses more than he wanted to uh, 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 deliver them from the plague. He gives Moses an opportunity to exercise the spirit of Christ that is in him, that is not willing that any should perish, but that all should be brought into repentance. So he tells Moses, tell your brother Aaron to take up the, uh, the, the censer. What is the censer? Censer is a mini altar of burnt offering. When fire needs to be burned, when an offering needs to be burned on this point, they cannot carry the whole, sorry, they cannot carry the whole of this altar. But for an incense to be burned right here, there has to be a mini altar of burnt offering, which is called the And right now, because plague has broke out in the camp, are dying as a result of their rebellion against God, God is telling Moses, take up the, uh, to instruct your brother Aaron, number one, to take up the censer. And he is not just to take up the censer, he has to pick fire from the altar of burnt offering. Because the fire of the altar of burnt offering is a fire that is lit by God himself. Are we together? So he's telling Moses, instruct your brother Aaron to pick up a censer. After picking up a censer, take the fire from the altar of the Lord. Light up a censer and go. Did he say walk? Did he say, let Aaron walk to where 
are dying. What did he say? Let him do what? Let him run very quickly because if he delays, the entire community is going to be wiped. In matter salvation, God is not delaying. Are we together? And I want to bring this to your attention. If there's anything that is pressing you down, if a plague has broken, you need to know that God is not delaying. He will come there with speed. Are we together? God sees a challenge in a church. And it comes with speed. Because God does not delay issues of salvation. And when he comes with the speed that a God can have, he finds people blocking his way. And he goes back weeping. So we find Arun running with speed, taking the, uh, taking the censer, which is a mini altar of burnt offering. And the moment he offered an atonement, the moment he offered a sacrifice of an atonement that is symbolized by the reconciliation that Christ had given unto us, the moment he went and stood between the dead and those who were living yet, what happened? The plague was tame, but the plague was top. That they are now being reconciled. Those who had rebelled against God are being reconciled unto God. And because of the process of reconciliation, that is a shadow of the death of Jesus Christ, the plague has to stop. It is significant for us to know that God in issues of salvation, number one, he is not willing that anyone should perish. And he will do everything possible. And he has done everything possible. Everything within the ability of God. He has done it. And he has not only done it, he did it with speed. He runs to save the lost human race. Because he tells Arun to run. So that the plague may be stayed. We need to know that. That this altar is an altar of reconciliation. And I wonder why, why you delayed. Why did you delay? You know, when I ask you, it's like I'm asking myself. I wish I could also sit and listen to the sermon at the same time. Unfortunately, we cannot take place. Yesterday, we challenged ourselves and we said, if you have somebody in mind with whom you have some kind of differences, with whom you have some kind of enmity, we challenged ourselves to make the initiative of reconciliation first step of reconciliation and you know you are your witness because you went back and it was difficult for you to do why no wonder the church is not growing because we have not understood the meaning of the altar of burnt offering we have people who do not talk one to another because we have not understand the meaning of the altar of burnt offering Let's move a little higher in this particular, with this particular piece of furniture. Let's open our Bibles to the book of Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service to, and being be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He says, 
I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. Where are we to present our bodies a living sacrifice? Right here at the altar of burnt offering. I said in the first day that there are certain things in our lives that need to be put to death. I want to give you an example. This is very interesting. As we have said, this altar is a shadow of reconciliation. But let's go on a little higher in this. Our Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, lived a life of sacrifice. He denied himself a lot of things. Because he's our example. Let us read from the book of 1 Peter 4 verse 1. Talking about Christ, it says, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself likewise with the same mind. For he has suffered in the flesh, hath ceased from sin. Why did he have to suffer? He suffered in the flesh, number one, because he had given up self. He had suppressed himself. God reducing himself to dwell in this fallen race, in this fallen humanity, that in itself is suffering to him. Are we, taking any, are we making any sacrifices for his sake? Let's go again to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. Verse 8 and 9. This is a very interesting verse. Hebrews chapter 5, 8 and 9 says, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Though he was a son. What kind of a son? A sign who is the same as the Father. Are we together? The sonship relationship between Christ and God is a unique one. Because I and the Father are one. So in other words, we can interpret this verse to mean, although he is one with God, although he is God, what, did, what happened to him? Though he were a son, yet he learned obedience. Did he obey? He learned obedience. He subjected himself to the process that humanity has to go through. Has to go through. Learning to obey. Are we making sacrifices to obey the cause of God? If he did, we ought to do it. Because he is our example. He suffered. He obeyed. We are called to live a life of sacrifice. Let me read something again in the book of Matthew, chapter 16, verse 24. It says, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. If any man wills to follow Jesus Christ, he must deny himself and do what? Take up his cross, which is a symbol of of burnt offering. In other words, there are things that must be literally put to death in our life. Minus that we want to grow. Let me show you how this was manifested in the life of the father of faith, Abraham. Let's go to the book of Hib uh, uh, Genesis. If you begin with Genesis chapter 17, just read the entire verse. Let's read verse 14 anyway. Genesis 17 verse 4, verse 5, sorry, verse 4, verse 8, and then verse 15. And then we go to Genesis chapter 22. As we, as we wind up because our time is up. Genesis chapter 17. Verse 
verse 4. What does the Bible say? This is when God renewed his covenant with Abraham. He says, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee. This is God giving his promises. My covenant is with thee, which is my promises with thee. And thou shalt be a father of how many nations? Thou shalt be a father of many nations. This is God speaking to Abraham. Let's go to verse uh, 8. And I will give unto thee, and to thy seed, after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So God is telling Abraham that he will maintain his covenant with him, and then he's promising Abraham that he will be a father of many nations. And then he's telling him he will give him that land of promise where as we speak, as he spoke to him, he was a stranger. So he's promising him a land that is a shadow of the heavenly kingdom. And I will be there with them. What does he say in verse 15? And God said unto Abraham, as for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. We know that Abraham was way stricken of age. He was old enough. And he could not give birth anymore. And Sarah was? Sarah was? Was? Was barren. So God gives a promise to Abraham. He tells Abraham, I will bless thee. And you will be a father of nations. You know all that story. At some point, they realize that oh, this might not really come to pass. Oh, Sarah is very old. Sarah is? Sarah is? Sarah is barren. There's no ability in her to give birth. And Abraham is way past age of giving birth. And so they sit with Sarah and say, Sarah convinces him to take for himself, the maid, the servant. Who was the servant maid? Was the, who was the name of the lady? And then Abraham goes into her and they give birth to a son, Ishmael. We said before that the principle upon which the prophecies of God apply is they are true when they are said as when they are fulfilled. Are we together? When God says a promise, the Bible says his promises are sure and amen. And we need to learn that. Because Abraham, although he is the father of faith, he failed on this particular point. He failed to realize that whatever God has said, there is power in the word of God to fulfill every promise that the Lord has said. And the Bible says all that is written in the Bible is written for our example. What is an example? That we may see from their failures and make an improvement. So Abraham fails to notice that the power is in the word of God. That whatever the word of God has said, God has promised through his word that he will have a son. He needed to trust in the word to bring forth a son. He did not need to make up a son for himself through a servant. And many people, in the, even in the church of God, are making for themselves sons. From the slave women. I hope you understand what I mean. Anyway, it reached a time that God tested his faith and eventually God brought to him a son that is Isaac. Now let us go very quickly because of time to uh, Genesis chapter 22, verse 13. After Isaac had been born,
And you know what happened? Sarah, who initiated the program of bringing forth Ishmael, was now not pleased with Ishmael. And he said that this one must go. After this is gone, God does something that is very serious to the heart of Abraham. I want to show you how that is related to the altar of burnt offering. Let's read 22 from verse 1. Genesis 22 from verse 1. <clears throat> God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. This is Abraham responding to the call of God. And he said, Take now thy son. Who is speaking? God. Who is speaking? He's telling who? Abraham. He says, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac. Let me continue reading the verse and then we, 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 we will uh, get into the study of this particular verse. Whom thou lovest and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. So God is telling Moses sorry Abraham Take who? Take your He did not just say take your son. He said Let me read it. And if you have your Bible, let's go there. Your Bible? Let's go there. It says Now the only son is God lying. How many does he have? How many sons? Two. Two. Because Ishmael is a son. He is not a son of, 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 of Sarah, but he is a son of Abraham. Are we together? So God is telling him, take your son. Your only son. Is he the only son? No. The word only son here means... Take your special kind of son. Are we together? Does God have a son? But does God also have sons? But does he have the only begotten son? But are you a son of God? Isaac is a type of Christ. Because he is a special son to Abraham. Are we together? Yes. So God tells him, take your special son, a one of his kind. That is the only son that you are having. The son that is dear to your heart. The one that you love most. Did God love Christ? <coughs> Did God love Christ? We will talk about the love of God if God will permit us. I know we don't have much time. So God tells him, take up your son, the one you love, the one who is dear to your heart, the one that means everything to yourself. And do what? Take him to Moriah. And they take a three days journey. You think it was an easy thing for Abraham? Was it an easy thing for Abraham? Abraham was right to pull up the Ten Commandments and say, Thou shalt not kill. He had, this, he had the best opportunity to raise up the Ten Commandments before God and tell him, God, thou shalt not kill. And what does that mean? The plan of salvation would not have been revealed to him. How many times do we get excuses? You know you are doing something wrong. And oh, even Abraham had many wives. And so you think because Abraham had many wives, and then you, you, you have a reason to marry the second and third wife. 
quoting from the Bible. I have seen, although we have the health message, one day I was in the NHI. Somebody is, is, is speaking. And then somebody is, is busy searching uh, the Proverbs. Ah, a little wine is good for your stomach. <laughs> what do we do? We get excuses from the Bible. Abraham was better placed to excuse himself, even with the Ten Commandments, and say, God, you have said, thou shalt not kill. But what did he say? Thy will only be done. It was not an easy thing. He takes a three days journey. That three days journey to Abraham was the most agonizing experience for Abraham. And then God is sending Abraham not only to any other place, to a place called Moriah. The Hebrew term that is translated Moria has a meaning of an elevated place, or it means seeing, or it means an understanding. So God is calling Moses because he wants to teach Abraham the plan of salvation. There were many hills, but he chose a particular hill with a meaning of seeing or discernment. Are you together? So take your son, your only son, this special son that whom thou lovest, and go with him to a particular mountain. That is Moriah. When they reached Moriah, what happened? You know that they went three days. After three days, Abraham started to see Moriah. And when he spotted Moriah, he told his servant, you stay behind with the ass, with the donkey. And then I will go forward with Isaac to offer what? To offer that offering. And they have left the, the servant and the donkey on their way. And they, yeah. On the way, Ab Isaac asks him, Daddy, I can see the wood. But where is the lamp? You think it was an easy thing. God will offer himself a lamp. It's a very interesting story. Go and read for yourself. As he raised his hands to kill him, then the angel spoke. Let me make a, uh, I want to make an assumption here. Who is the Lamb of God? Christ. And who spoke? I want to believe that in such special occasions, the archangel, who is Christ, is the one who was speaking to Abraham. I want to believe that. Because he was right there present in the form of a lamb. So when he was just about to kill his son, then the angel says, and the, uh, and the angel of the Lord came to him out of heaven and said, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, from me, thy only son means thy a son of is his kind, a special son unto you. You have not denied me, you are only special son. Now I know that you have me at heart. Now and Abraham lifted up his eyes, and he looked, and behold, him. A ram caught in a thicket by his horns. This is a very rich verse. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. So I want to say something, then we will pray and go home. So God calls Abraham, does him to go and offer his son, his only son, his special kind of a son, 
and take him to Moriah, meaning he God chose Moriah because he wanted to open his spiritual eyesight to see the plan of salvation. Moriah means a revelation or seeing or an elevated place. But for an experience like in Moriah, we must make a decision. I want you to see the painful, the most important, but the most painful decision that Abraham has to take. He has to give his best, his own, his future. Because remember, he has been promised a future. In who? In Isaac. But although the future has been promised in Isaac, God is telling you, now this that is your all. Put him to death. Have you been called to put something to death? The moment Abraham made that decision to put everything that has meaning to him to death, his spiritual eyes were opened. And he saw the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the whole world. Yesterday we challenged ourselves to exercise the meaning of this altar. But it was so difficult for us to seek reconciliation. My dear friends, the moment we will make a decision to make the heaviest, the most difficult decision in our lives for Christ, then we are still inside to the altar will have a meaning of Moriah as Abraham Because Moriah means sin. Moriah means a revelation. Moriah means an enlightenment. The moment we will make a decision to go to Moriah, the moment we will make a decision to put to death the most precious things of our lives, The moment we decide to give Christ, our eyes will open and we will see clearly the plan of salvation. When John is given an, uh, uh, an insight of heaven in Revelation, he sees the Lamb of God as he was slain. What does it mean? And when the, when, when the angels were, when the fellow disciples were disappointed, the Christ had ascended into heaven. The angel came and told them, Men of Galilee, why gives you up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come back in like manner, just as, as you have seen him go into heaven. Are you washed in the 